Hi everyone, my name is Frank Westfall and in this video I'm going to show you how to build your own sound absorption panels to acoustically treat a room properly. Like that. This is what I will show you how to build and hang on your wall. These sound absorption panels are perfect for home or professional recording studios, home theaters, or any other place where you want high quality sound. There's a lot of inaccurate information out there on ways to control the sound in a room. I've tried almost all of them, but you don't have to waste your time like I did because I'm going to show you how easy it is to just do it right the first time. I'm going to get right into the build here, but I highly recommend sticking around for the end of this video where I explain some simple but critical things regarding room sound. I also talk about planning how many panels to use, where to put them in the room, and the thicknesses they should be. So stick around if you want a deeper understanding. Alright, the build. Here we go. The following is a list of materials you'll need for each single panel. Two 48 inch pieces of 1x4 pine. Two 25.5 inch pieces of 1x4 pine. Two 24 inch pieces of 1x2 pine. One piece of semi-rigid fiberglass that is between 3 and 6 pound density and 2 inches thick. The common ones for these are Owens Corning 703, which is 3 pound density, and Owens Corning 705, which is 6 pound density. But there are off-brand versions of this, which is the exact same product, it's just not Owens Corning brand name, and they are a little less expensive. And then finally, you'll need any piece of fabric that is at least 38 inches wide and 62 inches long. You can get very cheap fabric at Walmart by the yard, and this is where I recommend getting it. That's where I got mine. You can choose any color combo, just make sure it's wide enough, at least 38 inches wide. Most of it is above 50 inches wide when you buy it by the yard. And these are the tools that you'll need. A hammer and some 2 inch finishing nails, or a drill and some 2 inch drywall screws. A measuring tape, a staple gun, a handsaw or skill saw, and a meter stick for leveling and hanging. Once you have all those materials, here's how you put it together. And just real briefly, I want to show you how you can source the raw materials for the frames. This is a large headboard from a bed that I found in an alley. I've just marked it off with the right sizes. So 25.5 by 3.5, got two of those for the widths of the panels. 3.5 by 48 for the lengths of the panels. You can see this is the 48 inch line and then these are the internal supports that go on the back two 24 inch pieces for the back and I'm just going to cut these to size with a skill saw if you're going and buying the 1x4 pine you won't have to cut it out of a flat piece like this but I just wanted to demonstrate that you can get the materials for this for free and it's pretty easy so now I cut out that chunk from the headboard threw the large pieces away now I have a nice piece here and I'm going to cut the individual pieces out of it. Alright, so here's all the pieces. Got our two lengths two widths and our two middle supports. So now we have all the pieces cut and I'm going to assemble it. I'm going to drill some pilot holes with a small drill bit to ensure that the wood doesn't crack. If you use finishing nails it won't crack for sure so you don't have to worry about the pilot holes but if you want to be sure that the wood doesn't crack when you put screws in it and drill pilot holes to begin with. And one thing that I want to point out when I discuss the thickness of the panels in regards to base traps. I'm talking about this thickness right here. It's the exact same process. The only thing that changes is the width of your pieces and the amount of rigid fiberglass that you put in it. When you're buying the wood, if you buy the wood, you want to decide what thicknesses you're going to want for the panel placement around the room and cut all those varying thicknesses at the same time. So when you assemble them, you just end up with the same panel but varying degrees of thickness on the panel and varying degrees of rigid fiberglass depth inside the panel. But for general purpose, the 3.5 inch width is great. And I say 3.5 inches because if you go buy one by four pine, 
it's actually going to be three quarters of an inch by 3.5 inches. So I'm going to put the pilot holes in. The reason these are 25.5 inches is to accommodate the three quarters of an inch thickness of this. So we want to put the top pieces on top of the 48 inch lengths. And what we're going to end up with is perfect two feet by four feet. And that means that the semi-rigid fiberglass panels that are two feet by four feet just drop right in place. Now I'm going to put some drywall screws in. These are an inch and a half, but two inches would be the ideal length. And you could also use finishing nails instead of drywall screws if you want. If you use finishing nails, you don't need pilot holes. And remember, with the frames, they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to look pretty. It's not going to matter because they're covered in fabric. And even if they're sloppy, even if the wood is mismatched, even if the cuts don't line up perfectly, when you cover them with fabric, they look really nice anyway. So now we have that. And now we're just gonna measure the placement of these. These are gonna go in here like this. And frankly, you don't even have to measure if you want, just anywhere in there where you basically divide it into three equal sections is gonna be good enough. I'm gonna measure it just for the sake of doing it accurately, but it really does not matter. I'm gonna put one at 16 inches and one at 32 inches. Mark that on both sides. So you end up with something like this. Do not worry about the aesthetics of the frame. I mean, this one turned out pretty nice, but it doesn't matter because it's gonna be completely covered. So now the frame is done. I'm going to lay out my fabric that I've cut. The fabric needs to be a minimum width of 38 inches. And it doesn't really matter if it's bigger than 38 inches, but it has to be at least 38 inches to be able to go completely around the frame and be stapled to the back and it should be a minimum length of 62 inches and a maximum length of whatever. If it's longer, that's fine. You can always staple the excess fabric on the back of the panel and it won't be visible. So I have my fabric cut to size. Just get it as flat as possible on the floor. And then I lay down my semi-rigid fiberglass. The semi-rigid fiberglass I'm using here is actually half inch. So it's half inch by two feet by four feet. And I use this in another panel that I took apart to make this video where I cut the corners out, but normally the corners won't be cut. And you can get this in half inch, one inch, two inch, four inch, I think even six inch and 12 inch thicknesses. If you're doing this the really easy way, get the two inch thickness ones. And then you're just literally putting one sheet of two inch thick semi-rigid fiberglass in each frame. Because I'm using half inch, I'm gonna do four of them. So it totals two inches. Just put your semi-rigid fiberglass down, take your frame and set it down on it like this. And then you just staple it shut. I like to do the top and bottom first and then the sides. And while you're doing this, if you lift up on the panel a little bit, then you can pull the fabric nice and taut and you'll see when it's all done, if we're pulling on the fabric as we're stapling it, it's perfectly smooth on the front face. And you can do the corners however you want. I like to just fold it. I just fold it over like that, pop a staple in, and I'll start going down the sides.
hanging out the bottom. And one thing I should note, this is actually slightly stretchable fabric. If you use stretchable fabric, they come out really nice. It makes it really easy to get it perfectly smooth on the front face. And this was super cheap. This was the cheapest black fabric they had at Walmart. And this is really imprecise stuff on the back. It doesn't have to be accurate because the front comes out looking beautiful. This panel is ready to hang on the wall. The fiberglass is just held in place between the wood panels on the back and the fabric on the front. It just floats in the middle there. All right, so now when it comes to hanging these, my favorite way to do it is just a small finishing nail, like a two inch finishing nail and two of them, about 16 inches apart. Just put a ruler up on your spots and throw a level on it. That's not quite perfectly level, but it's good enough. And I have one nail there, one nail there. I just take the panel, set the acoustic panel above the nails, and then let it slide right down into place. And there it is, just hanging off the nails. And you can see, if you step back, looks really nice. For the purpose of this project, I pulled some of my panels off the walls. And then real quickly, I just want to show you some corner stuff. You know, corner mounts are a little bit more tricky. I had to use um, some creative techniques to get that hung there and to make it look flush. But it's roughly a 45 degree angle. And then over in that corner, I've all, all four corners have those. Some more there. And these ones are different sizes that I made uh, previous I have a mix of sizes in here but if you really want to do it easy just make them all two by four those are the easiest ones to build and then one other thing on the ceiling I made some racks that these can just hang from and put two of them up there and then actually the one that I just built I had ripped down from the ceiling and it actually went in between these two so the whole idea is you have your monitors and then the sound is coming this way and it's just going directly into the panel so it's not bouncing off the wall. All right, in the beginning of this video, I said I would talk in more detail at the end of this video about a couple critical concepts to understand and about panel placement and thickness. So here it is. Acoustically treating a room can get very specific in cases of high-end recording and mastering studios. But for home or average recording studio applications, you can get 90% of the way there with enough of these panels placed in the right locations and corner base traps. And these are transportable. So if you move, you can take them with you and hang them in your new space. You really only have to make these one time in your life. If you're going to build a number of panels, I suggest making them all at once. It's easier to do it like a production line than it is to do them one at a time. Any amount of these panels helps, but if you really want to do it well, build and install between two and four of these panels for each wall, and then two to four on the ceiling, plus corner base traps, so it looks something like this. And here's an image showing the ceiling panels as well. If you do all that, you are completely covered. It is a fair amount of work but you won't have to think about whether or not it will be effective. It will be effective at controlling your sound. It will. It will be a night and day difference between before you put the panels in the room and after. And regarding bass traps, I'm not demonstrating them specifically here. However, four, six, and eight inch thickness versions of these panels are effective bass traps placed in the corners. For example, this is a four inch thickness and it's technically 3.5 inches because if you get a piece of one by four pine, it's actually 0.34 by 3.5. So I made this one 3.5 because it's the exact same width as a piece of commercial pine would be. But for the base traps, you can just use a panel like this, 
but just make it thicker. Maybe you want to make one that's eight inches thick, and then instead of having two inches of the rigid fiberglass inside of it, you have four inches or six inches or eight inches of the rigid fiberglass in it. And for base, for lower frequencies, you can use a higher density, like the six pound, and they even make a 12 pound density, semi-rigid fiberglass. And those would be ideal for your corners. Thicker and higher density in your corners, and then a mix between the three pound density and six pound density around the room on the walls and ceiling. And as you saw in the pictures, the ones that you put in the corners, you wanna put at 45 degree angles. So when you're planning this out, you can plan to make varying thicknesses and then use the thicker ones as corner base traps. This is the way I typically do it now. In the past, I had actually built frames and put a bunch of R13 insulation in them and jammed in there really nice and tight so it made it a higher density. And those were really good base traps. They worked really well, but they're built into the room. I prefer just making thicker panels for the corners now because if I wanna pull them out, they're easy to remove. They're not built into the room, they're just hanging there. Now, regarding the actual sound absorption materials, most professional studios are using the semi-rigid fiberglass as their sound absorption material, which is exactly what I just used in this build and what I recommend you use as well. But there are other suitable materials as well, and if you really wanna research it, you can find the other materials. Usually it's a combination of semi-rigid fiberglass and possibly some other stuff or just semi-rigid fiberglass. To keep it easy, I recommend the semi-rigid fiberglass across the board, just use different densities and different thicknesses of it. The Owens Corning 703 panels are three pound density per cubic foot, and the Owens Corning 705 panels are six pound density per cubic foot. Also, there are generic versions of rigid fiberglass panels as well, which use the same material, but cost less because they're not Owens Corning brand. I put a bunch of helpful links in the description, including places to get semi-rigid fiberglass. Now, a couple critical concepts to understand. Sound isolation. Sound isolation is the prevention of sound from entering a room or leaving a room. You don't want sound coming in your room from the outside world or your neighbors or anywhere else if you're doing recording or if you wanna have a high quality listening environment for home theater or something. And you also don't want the sound you create in your room to be going out into the outside world and bothering people. When you prevent sound from coming in or going out, what you're doing is isolating. For example, we all know drywall is pretty effective at sound isolation, especially if you use very thick drywall or layer it. But if you stand inside a plain drywall room and talk, there are echoes and reverberations all over the place. This is because the drywall is isolating, meaning the sound has nowhere to go. So it just keeps bouncing around the room until eventually it loses all its energy. Rooms that isolate but don't absorb are absolutely horrible for recording or listening. So when you're setting up your room, think about how you're going to prevent sound from entering and leaving the room first, and then think about how you're going to absorb the sound that you're creating in the room second. The next concept to understand, which I just touched on, is sound absorption. Sound absorption is the process of absorbing the sound that's already in a room so that the sound waves don't bounce around the room and create standing waves and phase cancellation. When sound is absorbed in these panels, it is actually converted to heat energy, and that's how the sound energy is dissipated. Sound absorption is technically helping to isolate as well because the sound is no longer sound after it has been converted to heat energy. Therefore, it cannot escape the room. But I do not consider it sound isolation in its purest form, and I like to separate the difference between isolating a room and then absorbing the sound within a room. In relation to sound absorption, I'll talk quickly about broad spectrum absorption material. We've all seen the triangular foam panels, carpet on the walls, rigid foam ceiling tiles, the egg carton thing, etc., etc. This stuff is all garbage in my opinion, and I've tried some of it. It is not broad spectrum absorption material. What it will do is only absorb some of the frequencies in the room, typically only the higher frequencies. For example, it's very easy to absorb 10 kilohertz frequencies, but it's not so easy to absorb 150 hertz frequencies because the low and low mid-range frequencies have much higher energy levels. That's why in the places where low frequencies accumulate, like corners, you wanna use thicker and denser material because it's higher energy, so you need something that can absorb more of that sound energy and dissipate it. If you don't use broad spectrum absorption material, 
you will not be absorbing across the spectrum of human hearing. And what you will hear in that room will be very different from what the sources of the sound actually sound like. If you mix in a room with incomplete broad spectrum absorption, your mixes will always be off when you play them anywhere outside of that room. And I've gone through this endlessly in my old days of recording engineering before I learned what I was doing. I would mix in a room and it would sound, I would be like, that's great, sounds great. I bring it out, put it in my car. I'm like, oh man, the mixes are completely off. What's going on? And then put it on a stereo in someone's house. Oh man, the mixes are completely off. What's going on? The room was absorbing some frequencies, but not absorbing others. So what I heard in the room was always going to be different than what I would hear in the outside world. Since I've been using proper broad spectrum absorption in my studios, the mixes I make basically sound good no matter where I play them. Because when a room has been treated properly, it becomes more accurate in producing what the original sound sounded like than something like a car stereo or a home stereo. And that's the whole point of having a high quality listening environment or recording studio is that you're able to hear the sound with a higher degree of precision, therefore you can mix it better or hear it better than you would be able to in some other environment. And the keys to broad spectrum absorption are the densities and thicknesses of the materials and where they're placed in the room. If the material is too dense, the sound will bounce off and be reflected. If it is not dense enough, the sound will pass through, bounce off the wall behind it, pass through it again, and continue to bounce around the room. If the material is the right density, but too thin, it won't absorb lower frequencies as well. And if it is too thick, it will absorb all the sound that hits it, period. The maximum absorption possible would be no reflected sound whatsoever, but that is almost impossible to achieve in practical reality. Overall, the more sound reflections you can absorb, the cleaner your captured sound will be, and that will give you the most options if you're doing audio engineering in post-production because you'll be capturing the cleanest signal of your source sound possible. For example, you want sound to go from your voice directly to the microphone. You don't want it to go from your voice to the walls and then to the microphone. That goes for any other sound source and capture medium, like a guitar amp to a microphone or a horn to a microphone. Whatever it is, you don't want it bouncing off the walls and then going to your microphone. You want it to go from the source to the microphone. So to summarize all that, you want broad spectrum absorption and the best material for that is semi-rigid fiberglass. That's why I use that material in my panels and most studios do. To end, I'll just say that we could go into endless detail and get super specific. But as I mentioned earlier, panels like these placed in the right spots will get you 90% of the way there. If you build and install these, your room will sound way better. Thank you for watching. Please put any questions you have in the comment section. I do try to answer them. And if you found this helpful, please hit the subscribe button below for more how-to videos and other videos as well. Thank you. Bye.